Good morning, everybody. We'd like to start in about two minutes. If everybody can kindly take your seats, uh, we'd like to start in about two minutes. Thank you so much. Good morning. Good morning. All right, I'm a good teacher, so I'll say it one more time. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you all for being here, and welcome. Welcome to all of the allies, to the parents, to community members, the educators, students, our friends, and union siblings who have joined us today to defend one of the most critical pillars of our democracy, public education. My name is Frederick Ingram, and I'm the Secretary Treasurer of the American Federation of Teachers. I'm also a product of the Miami-Dade County Public School System, a former teacher in the Miami-Dade County Public School System, and my children attended public schools in the state of Florida. I believe in America's public schools. But in too many places around this country, those schools and the people who work in them are under attack. And that's hurting our kids. After decades of disinvestment and then the upheaval of the pandemic, our students, our schools, and our teachers need support and solutions, not culture wars and attacks. We're living through a pivotal moment, teetering on a very slim edge that can tip toward book banning, criminalizing families, and more devastating school violence. Or it can tip towards something big and something powerful in this country and all throughout this nation. This is a pivot point, and how we move forward will determine the lifespan of our democracy. I know I'm looking forward to what Randy is gonna lay out today. But first, I'd like to take a minute to introduce some of the friends who, like us, care deeply about the future of our democracy, and who know that the future depends on a robust, well-funded, inclusive public education. First, you'll hear from Tracy Lassen, a Houston ISD Career Pathways teacher from Maryland Performing and Middle Arts, I'm sorry, Performing Arts uh, Middle School. She serves on the HISD Legislative Advisory Committee, the Texas Gulf Coast Area Labor Federation, the Houston Federation of Teachers Union Board of Trustees, the Houston Ethics Commission, and the Harris County Safe Schools Commission. She's a busy woman. She'll be joining Courtney Revels, who is a mom to a second grader in Houston, Texas. The state took over her daughter's school in the mid 2000s and she knows just what happens when politicians interfere with education. As well as Allison Newport, who is also a parent to a third grader and a fifth grader who attends a Houston ISD school. She serves as a parent representative to the Houston ISD Legislative Advisory Committee volunteers at her neighborhood elementary school as vice president of the PTO, and as parent representative on the Shared Decision-Making Committee. Again, thank you all for being here. Please join me in welcoming our friends from Houston, Texas. Thank you, Houston. 
Yeah. Well, I want to thank you all for showing up today. This is not a good moment that I had to leave my students to come here and talk to you today and literally to plead for your help. My name is Tracy Latson, and I'm a Houston ISD Career Pathway teacher leader. I teach seventh and eighth grade career education at Meyer Lamb Performing and Visual Arts School. I serve as the CTE department chair, and I wanna say shout out to AFT for all the work that they are doing supporting CTE work. Um, also establishing a multiple career pathway for students and a shout out to the Texas Gulf Coast Labor Federation for its high school apprentice program. As teachers, we are committed to ensuring all students have the tools they need to succeed. No matter the zip code, family life, religion affiliation, or gender, teachers are there to uplift students to reach their full potential. Good public schools are at the center of thriving neighborhoods. All across the country, we see an influx of politicians inflicting their conservative agendas in school systems. Like in Houston, with a hostile state takeover of Houston ISD, the eighth largest school district in the United States and the largest school district in Texas. It serves over 194,000 students at 276 campuses. Texas Education Agency Commissioner Mike Morath will appoint a new board and superintendent in June. That's chilling because we, frankly, we don't know what to expect. We can only go by past history and it is not good in Texas. For the record, Houston ISD is not a failing district. The very state agency that is going to take it over gave it a rating of a B plus academic rating and a B plus financial rating. State takeover. State takeover siphons local control from the community and ushers in conservative agendas like whitewash curriculum, vouchers, and charter schools. Do you, note it that, do you notice that these tactics seem to be used to support disproportionately against school districts with significant populations of students of color? Instead of helping students, data shows takeovers harm students. And it angers me because politicians know takeover is not about raising student outcomes or assisting children to recover from learning loss after the pandemic but it's about control. It's a power grab from local communities. We don't need politicians and culture wars in our classroom, which Randy will discuss later on today. We need full funding for our public schools and support for our teachers and support staff. Our message is yes to funding and no to politics. Yes to funding, full funding, because the game is they fund you, but they underfund you. And then they want to turn around and say you're not achieving. Ask any teacher, administrator, support staff, parent, student, guardian, and they will tell you the same. Yes to full funding and no to politics. Fund our schools and keep politics out of the classroom. Children are not pawns. Children are not pawns, but this is where we are. Yes to funding, no to politics. Thank you. Hello, my name is Courtney Rebels. I'm also a Houstonian, and I'm blessed to have a wonderful second grader that goes to BC Elmore Elementary School. Um, my daughter's school is in the former North Forest ISD um, school district that was taken over by the Texas Education Agency in the mid-2000s and later handed back to HISD without any full support. Um, my community knows very well how poorly um, the, state take, the 
the Texas handles takeovers. We've seen firsthand that the conditions get worse. And what we really need is cooperation between all of us to help support our kids and not political interference. Okay, so that's why I'm speaking up. That's why I'm an active member of Community Voices. And that's why I'm here today, because AFT has helped us to make the real work possible instead of pushing an agenda of high stakes testing and privatizations where students get lost in the shuffle. And that happens often, so often in black and brown communities and specifically my community of North Forest. Um, I wanna ensure that my community does not continue to get the short end of the stick when it comes to mun municipal resources, parks, school support, and even grocery stores. Cause I also live in a food desert. Mm. And I know our teachers and their union share the same commitment in the in the way that some politicians seem to struggle to understand. So thank you guys. Thanks, Courtney. Good morning. My name is Allison Newport, and I'm the proud parent of a third and a fifth grader in Houston ISD schools. I'm very involved in my school community and in our community in Houston. I'm invested in this effort we're in together to make sure that kids have all the tools they need to succeed and in working together with the teachers to make sure it happens. The time is now for our teachers, parents, school staff, and students in our community to come together to talk about how we can fight for and improve our neighborhood public schools. That's the work that H AFT has always done, and I know it's work the folks up here are committed to. But I also know there are so many other parents like Courtney and I and teachers like Tracy who are committed to this fight. Despite what certain politicians may say, teachers and parents are in this together. We know what our kids need. It's not culture wars, endless testing, and vouchers. It's books, extracurriculars, math, computers, respect, empathy, and the skills to become future leaders. We want to thank AFT and President Weingarten for inviting us here today and for the powerful Partnership Institute grants the union gave out to communities around the country to help deepen parent, community, teacher, and school partnerships. Those resources help us find solutions and do the work our communities need. I know we're in this together and we will win this together. Now we'll hear from Evelyn DeJesus, a fearless leader in this fight, and the Executive Vice President of the American Federation of Teachers. Thank you. Buenos dias, good morning everyone. Thank you, Allison, and we're so glad to be with our union family from Houston and with all of you today. I just need you to really understand what's happening today. It's a critical moment it's a very critical moment for public schools in America. While right-wing right extremists have unleashed a no-holds-bar no attack on teachers, teachers' unions, and public education itself, AFT President Randy Weingarten, my president, my sister, is going to talk about solutions, not problems, but solutions on the table, and how we can work together to do what we really help our kids, our communities, academically, socially, and emotionally. And now, it gives me great uh, privilege to introduce, and this is the best thing that could ever happen to a teacher, to have a former student come and introduce her. A person that she uh, poured into, she taught, was a friend, and now is a teacher herself of 23 years, standing up for her teacher, for her public schools, for her New York City, for her nation, Tamara, Tamara Simpson. Please come up, Tamara. Thank you so much. Good morning, everyone. <laughs> My name is Tamara Simpson, and though I was born in Jamaica, West Indies, I'm a proud graduate of New York City Public Schools. <laughs> PS 316 on Classen Avenue in Crown Heights, Brooklyn, IS 320 in Crown Heights, and Clara Barton High School in, you guessed it, Crown Heights, Brooklyn. <laughs> It was in high school that I had one of the greatest experiences as a student. I took an AP political science class at Clara Barton, taught by Dr. Leo Casey. 
and Randy Weingarten. It was there that my classmates and I learned about the principles of Enlightenment thinkers who influenced the framework of American democracy. Here, I first heard the names John Locke, Montesquieu, and Jean-Jacques Rousseau. We participated in, in a debate competition called We the People, where under the tutelage of Randy and Leo, we used the Bill of Rights and our US Constitution as the backbone of our research into civic issues. We presented our findings using information we researched as well as our experience as mostly black and West Indian immigrants living in one of the most diverse neighborhoods in Brooklyn. The rights we studied and referenced in civic debates are the very same ones that are now under attack by some of the elected officials and politicians who seem to have forgotten that it is their job to protect our democracy. I graduated from Clara Barton 29 years ago, and today I am proud to serve as a teacher of speech improvement at the Prospect Heights High School campus. <laughs> a New York City public school located directly across the street from Clara Barton High School. <laughs> I mentioned the name of the neighborhood where I was raised and schooled because I am now serving students and families in the very place where I was educated and have been doing so proudly for 23 years. As an educator, I challenge students to strive to be their best. I challenge them to think critically, to become engaged and aware of what is happening in our communities and government and to use their voice whenever possible to make change. 18 years ago, my role shifted to include being a parent of a child attending a New York City public school. Angelique was nurtured by dynamic and caring teachers, but it was a small moments that made the biggest impressions. Memories like Ms. Paracella driving to our home over the summer vacation to drop off a welcome to third, third grade card we still remember that to this day. <laughs> Her fourth grade teacher, Ms. Glazelis, rehearsed holiday songs with the class and surprised parents with a small impromptu show. It is these interactions that have made long-lasting impact. It saddens me to see our public schools under attack. I truly believe that it is crucial that we remain strong in our support of public education. I was taught that it is both our right and our obligation to fight to uphold the promise of our democracy. The American Federation of Teachers, under the leadership of Randy Weingarten, is at the forefront of this fight. So today, it is my privilege to present to you our AFT president and my former teacher, <laughs> Randy Weingarten. This, this is why we do what we do. Yes. This, Absolutely. and would the three of you come up for a second? Yes, yes, yes. Just come up for a second. Because this is what it's about. This. This, this work. The, the thank you, the two teachers. The two, the three parents, yes. probably the four parents, <laughs> the grandparent. This is what we do. This is who we are. This is what public education represents. And all my makeup is now gone. You don't need makeup. But this is what it is. I just wanted people to grok that for a minute. And none of us. Can you imagine the joy and the pride any teacher has to have a student like Tamara? And to see Tamara go into teaching and speech pathology in the same neighborhood in which we taught. That's generation to generation. Thank you, all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Really, thank you. Thank you. So I just, you know, because of what happened yesterday, 
I really want to take a minute to grieve for the families shattered by senseless gun violence. So join me for a moment of silence for the lives lost at the Covenant School in Nashville and for all victims of gun violence. Their memories are a blessing. Zikranan Lebracha. Today, we renew our call for common sense gun safety legislation, including a ban on assault weapons. This is an epidemic. It's an epidemic that our great nation must solve. And how many lives will be shattered before we have the courage to do what Scotland did, what Australia did, what New Zealand did, what other great democracies do. We must solve this epidemic. And that's up to us. So there is a saying, you don't have to love everything about someone to love them. I'm sure my wife, who is here with us today, Rabbi Sharon Kleinbaum, I'm sure she doesn't love everything about me, but she loves me. I, by the way, on the other hand, love everything about her. <laughs> Saying that for the record. Nothing is perfect. Banks aren't, as we've seen in the last few weeks. Congress isn't. And neither are our public schools, not even our most well-resourced and highest performing schools. And those of us involved in public schools, we work hard to strengthen them to be the best they can be. But only public schools have as their mission providing opportunity for all students. And by virtually any measure, conversations, polls, studies, elections, parents and the public overwhelmingly like public schools, value them, need them, support them, and countless Americans love them. Public schools are more than physical structures. They are the manifestation of our civic values and ideals. You just heard Tamara talk about that, talk about the class we had, the ideal that education is so important for individuals and for society that a free education must be available to all that all young people should have opportunities to prepare for life, for college, for career, for citizenship, that in a pluralistic society such as the United States, people with different beliefs and backgrounds must learn to bridge differences. And that, as the founders believed, an educated citizenry is essential to protect our democracy from demagogues. Thomas Edison, excuse me, he probably argued it too, but Thomas Jefferson <laughs> argued that general education was necessary to enable every man to judge for himself what will secure or endanger his freedom. Franklin Roosevelt said, the real safeguard of democracy is education. And Martin Luther King Jr., in accepting the United Federation of Teachers John Dewey Award, made clear Education is the road to equality and citizenship. When kids go to school together, they become part of a community. Their families become part of a community. The community comes together at school, concerts, basketball games, science fairs. And for shelter and comfort, when people are displaced by natural disasters, or as we're now seeing in Nashville today, at vigils for victims of gun violence. In good times and bad, public schools are cornerstones of our community, of our democracy, of our economy, of our nation. But some people want that cornerstone to crumble and they're wielding sledgehammers. Attacks on public education are not new. 
The difference today is that the attacks are intended to destroy it, to make it a battlefield, a political cudgel. After former President Trump lost re-election, his key ally, Steve Bannon, declared that the fight goes right through school boards. And in a speech last year, cultural war operative and a Governor Ron DeSantis appointee, Christopher Rufo, put it bluntly, and I quote his words, to get to universal school choice, you really need to operate from a premise of universal public school distrust. To this end, he says his side has to be ruthless and brutal. Just think about that for a minute. And I would add, well-funded, which it is. The DeVos, Bradley, Koch, Uline, Walton Foundations, and others have poured many millions of dollars into anti-public education, pro-privatization groups with nice sounds like the American Federation of Children and EdChoice. The Betsy DeVos wing of the school privatization movement is methodically working its plan. Starve public schools of the funds they need to succeed, criticize them for their shortcomings, erode trust in public schools by stoking fear and division, including attempting to pit parents against teachers and replace them with private, religious, online, and home schools. All towards their end goal of destroying public education as we know it, atomizing and balkanizing education in America, bullying the most vulnerable amongst us, and leaving the students with the greatest needs in public schools with the most meager resources. That's their plan. It's an extremist scheme by a very vocal minority of Americans. It's hurting our efforts to do the work we need to do. And what is that work? To educate the nearly 50 million kids who attend America's public schools and the urgent work of helping kids recover from learning loss, from sadness, from depression, and from the other effects of the pandemic. And what this division is doing, it's contrary to what parents and the public want. So let's start with defunding. I just want to tell a bit of a story of what's going on all around the country. This year alone, 29 state legislatures are considering bills to either create or expand existing voucher programs. That's on top of 72 voucher and tax credit programs that are already in 33 states, already subsidizing private and homeschooling, and all of this costs billions every year. Voucher programs are proliferating, even though research shows that on average, vouchers negatively affect achievement. The declines are worse than pandemic learning loss. In fact, vouchers have caused some of the largest academic drops ever measured in the research record. Proponents of vouchers used to argue they were a way for low-income and minority fa families to transfer out of low-performing schools. We've all heard those arguments. It's a way out for low-income minority families. No longer. Today, most vouchers go to families who already send their kids to private schools. And private schools are not required to follow most federal civil rights laws protecting students. So they can, and many do, discriminate, especially against LGBTQ students and students with special needs. I see the teachers and parents shaking their heads. 
So take the universal voucher program just signed by Florida Governor Ron DeSantis yesterday. It will divert $4 billion from the state's public schools. That's just what we can count. Florida already ranks 44th in the nation in per pupil spending and 48th in the nation in average teacher salaries. So DeSantis is sending taxpayer dollars in the wrong direction. And then there are the culture wars. What started as fights over pandemic era safety measures have morphed into fear mongering. False claims that elementary and secondary schools are teaching critical race theory. Disgusting, unfounded claims that teachers are grooming and indoctrinating students. And pronouncements that public schools push a woke agenda even though they can't or won't define what they mean. Banning books and bullying vulnerable children. School board meetings descending into screaming matches. This is an organized and dangerous effort to undermine public schools. Over the last three years, legislators in 45 states proposed hundreds of laws placing public schools at the center of the culture wars. Laws seeking to ban books from school libraries. Even books about, let's see, Ruby Bridges, this book. Anne Frank, this book. Roberto Clemente, this book. These books. Laws restricting what teachers can teach and students can learn, particularly about race and gender, LGBT issues, current events, American history. Tomorrow, I don't think I could actually teach most of what we taught you in the 90s in Florida right now. And laws attacking everything about transgender kids. <sighs> Students and staff should feel welcome, safe, and respected in school. But the culture wars are fueling hostility and fear. A torrent of legislation targeting even the mention of controversial topics and sensitive material, sweeping and open-ended restrictions on what can be taught, has teachers teaching on eggshells. In Florida, the de their Department of Education, not the Federal Department of Education, and I'm so glad that one of the deputy secretaries is here with us today, Cindy Martin. In Florida, their Department of Education has threatened teachers and librarians with felony prosecution if they provide students with books that the state later decides are inappropriate. If Florida lawmakers have their way, colleges will no longer have diversity, equity, or inclusion policies, or tenure, or academic freedom, and AP courses and the mere utterance of LGBTQ will be banned in all K through 12 schools. And just forget about the facts. Many laws and pending bills allow any individual to sue schools and teachers for perceived violations. The intent and the effect are to create a climate of fear and intimidation, and that is what they are doing. This takes a toll on the quality of education teachers can provide our students and on the trust and the connection that are so important. Shouldn't teachers be able to answer the question of kids who are withdrawn or in distress? How do we not deal with that? And, and, and don't we want students to learn both our nation's achievements 
the things that make us proud, as well as the failings that make us strive to do better. That's America. And frankly, that's an educator's job. Teachers should have the freedom to teach, and students should have the freedom to learn. These same governors who are pushing voucher and culture wars are also trying to defund and weaken teacher unions so educators don't have the wherewithal to fight back against censorship, attacks on their academic freedom, threats to their livelihoods, and potential criminal prosecution. These attacks aren't about protecting kids. If they were, these same governors would be working with us to address learning loss and the youth mental health crisis. They'd be working with us to take on social media companies for contributing to that crisis. If these attacks were about protecting kids, they'd be working with us to fight against the leading cause of death of American children, gun violence. If they were about protecting kids, instead of putting LGBTQ youth at risk and banning books about black people and by black authors, these governors would give a damn about kids' safety and the well-being of kids, including the youth suicide crisis. 45% of LGBTQ youth seriously considered suicide last year, and the suicide rate amongst black youth of all sexual orientations have been increasing as well. It's literally a matter of life and death. These attacks on public education make it increasingly difficult to create the welcoming, safe environment that our students need and deserve. It's a fraught time in our country. The effects of COVID, the climate of conflict, drug abuse, gun violence, economic insecurity, the youth mental health crisis, They've all taken a heavy toll. Hate crimes have surged against many Americans, Asian, Black, Latino, Jewish, and Muslim Americans. And school staff also report a rise in bullying, verbal altercations, and physical violence, both among students and that behavior directed at them as well. I recall a teacher saying <clears throat> that when her students are disruptive, it's not because they're bad, it's because they're sad. So many students have experienced isolation and trauma. They need help. But there weren't enough mental health specialists before the pandemic, and they're in critically short supply right now. And this persistent demonization and disrespect of teachers from the screaming matches at school board meetings to a former secretary of state saying teachers teach filth have contributed to a culture of disrespect that seeps into our schools. So, not surprising, I just got a report from Florida. In Flagler County, a 17-year-old student with special needs pushed a para so hard that she went airborne and was knocked unconscious. A teacher in Osceola County was monitoring students in the hallway when she got sucker punched. There are other stories like this. But the educators who were all hurt, this is what they cited, a lack of staff in schools and a lack of mental health supports for, as the main reasons leading up to these attacks. But think about it. This crisis will only get worse as Governor DeSantis' universal voucher bill kicks in. Think about this. What will the loss of $4 billion do to safety in Florida's public schools? What will that do to the quality of academics, to the condition of school buildings, to teacher pay, to staff shortages? We all know the answer to that. Even before the pandemic, there were steep declines in teacher satisfaction. The percentage of teachers who were very satisfied fell from 62% in 2008 to 12%, 12% in 2022. The stresses of the COVID era, plus the culture wars, attacks on teachers, inadequate pay, poor teaching and learning conditions, and the threat of school shootings 
This has made the last few years the toughest in modern times for educators. I often say educators MacGyver better than MacGyver, but at one point or another, enough is enough. Despite it all, teachers have thrown themselves into the mission of helping students recover academically, socially, and emotionally. You heard Tamara. I witness these acts of teaching, of nation building every day. Yet, according to our critics, we're responsible for all the woes of society. Even before the pandemic, and we don't have perfect numbers on this because teaching and education is state-based and locally based. But even before the pandemic, nearly 300,000 teachers were leaving the profession each year. Now, based upon our estimates and others' estimates, it's closer to 400,000. And the teacher pipeline has collapsed as well as college students and career changers choose not to go into education. Think about those polls of parents who say they love their kids' teachers, but they never want their kids' teachers, they never want their kids to become teachers. They love their kids' teachers, but never want their kids to become teachers. So how are we going to recruit and retain the staff that our schools need in this climate? Our teaching profession is really in crisis. And the reasons are obvious. It's in crisis because of all that's happening right now, but it's in crisis as well because of the poor teaching and learning conditions created by inadequate funding. You heard that before, what, what Courtney and Allison and Tracy said earlier. It's teacher pay, which has been falling relative to other college graduates' pay for the last 40 years. It's giving teachers all the blame and little authority. And it's the deprofessionalization of teaching that demoralizes an already beleaguered profession. I hear it all the time. And the last time I was standing on this stage, I talked about it as well. Teachers just want to teach. So, where do we go from here? The American Rescue Plan and the programs it spawned, particularly the tutoring programs, have really helped. And we're grateful to President Joe Biden, Secretary Miguel Cardona, and the last Congress for the much needed resources. And of course, we will continue to fight this defunding of public schools and this dividing of our communities. But we also must do a better job to address the learning loss and the disconnection we are seeing in our young people. And we can. We can make every public school a school where parents want to send their kids, where educators want to work, and where all our students thrive. We can. Four strategies can help transform our schools to realize the promise and purpose of public education, not just to overcome learning loss or get us back to normal, but to truly prepare all kids with the knowledge and skills they need for their lives, for college, for career, and for citizenship. These strategies can help us create safe and welcoming environments and bring the joy back to learning. The joy we heard from the parents here about extracurricular activities, about wanting to be in school. And in tandem, these four strategies have a catalytic effect, a transformative effect. I've seen it. I've watched it. But we need to do these strategies at scale for every child and every school. These four strategies are expanding community schools, scaling experiential learning, addressing staff shortages, and deepening the partnership between families and educators. If you remember one thing I say today, that's it. Those four strategies taken together. So first and foremost, we need to make sure our kids are okay. That's why we need community schools, which 
wrap services around schools. They're hubs for neighborhoods. They combine academics and extended learning opportunities. They combine family and community events. And they have an infusion of medical, mental health, and other social services. They're the best system I know to connect students and families to the support that families and students need to learn, to live, and to thrive. A recent University of Calgary study found that youth suicide attempts increased 22% during the pandemic. According to the CDC, nearly one in three teen girls seriously considered suicide in 2021, up nearly 60% from a decade ago. More than 42% of high school students reported persistent feelings of sadness and hopelessness. I raise all this because that's the reality that all of us and parents and families are dealing with. So what helps? The Calgary report found, and I quote, that school connectiveness, defined as feeling close to people at school, has a long-lasting protected impact for adolescents well into adulthood. Our schools must be equipped to support and connect with students. And there's no better model than that, the community schools. And then there's another tragic reality in the United States. Half the students in America's public schools live in poverty. Community schools help here as well by mitigating the effects of poverty by providing essential services right where students are and families can be. Our kids' physical and emotional needs are met. They're ready to learn. And teachers can focus on, what a concept, their primary role, which is to teach. So a few weeks ago, I went back to Wolf Street Academy, a community school in Baltimore, to see how they were doing. 96% of the students there qualify for free or reduced price lunch. And since converting to a community school nearly 20 years ago, Wolf has gone from the 77th most successful elementary school in Baltimore, that's out of 80, up to the second most successful. And, and like other community schools, when COVID hit, it was a matter of ramping up services, not having to start from scratch. So schools, community schools, like Wolf, they have access to medical checkups, clothing, and mental health services. Families have food assistance, language support, and legal aid. And the school is a lot of fun. Just go there any day. And you're going to see a variety of after-school activities, including chess club, robotics club, Mexican folkloric dance, orchestra, a soccer league, and more. And just by the way, Wolf is a unionized public charter school. They became a charter under the Baltimore laws when they, didn't, when they were forced to change their curriculum. And they said, no. We want to keep our curriculum, and we want to stay public, and we want to stay unionized. And that's what Wolf is. There are successful community schools in rural and suburban areas as well. We have a lot of New Yorkers here today. The Rome, New York Teachers Association in upstate New York started a community school with help from the AFT in 2016. Today, its connected model has spread to 14 school districts and provides everything from access to mental health services and dental care to food packages for weekends and holidays and, get this, prom dresses. <clears throat> you get my drift here. A recent RAND study showed that community schools in New York City found positive impacts on both attendance and graduation rates. In New Mexico, community schools in operation for five or more years have better than average student achievement growth and higher attendance rates, and employed people who wanted to be teachers and were highly effective. And in the Robeson High School in Philadelphia, they went from nearly closing to a 95% graduation rate after implementing the community school model. So AFT members, have helped create 700 community schools across the country. And we see how they meet kids' needs. From Kimball Elementary in Washington, D.C., 
to Euler in Cincinnati, to Royal Allard Elementary in Los Angeles, and on and on and on. That's why we are calling for 25,000 community schools by 2025, and our call is gaining steam. California just approved another 45 million to make one in three schools a community school, and President Biden's budget doubles federal community school investment. We need to make this happen everywhere. Second, we can re-engage students through experiential learning, transforming their education experiences. And before anybody says, what's experiential learning? I will talk about it over the next few minutes. But think about it. Why do kids skip school? Why do they slump in the back of the classroom? Many feel unsafe or unseen or just uninterested. We must do better, and we can. Of course, fundamental academic subjects are important, but so is how we teach them. What experiential learning does is engage, it engages students through problem solving and critical thinking and teamwork and learning by doing. We need to help kids engage with the world, with ideas and with each other, not just with their devices. Experiential learning embeds the things that make kids want to be in school. The excitement of learning that is deeply engaging, the joy of being together, especially after the isolation of the last few years, the camaraderie and responsibility of working on a team. And in the age of AI and chat GPT, this type of learning is critical to being able to think and write and solve problems and apply knowledge and discern fact from fiction. Experiential learning can be applied to any content area, from math to computer science to social studies. It often weaves together subjects in a powerful interdisciplinary instruction. It can be adopted at any grade level. It can take place in rural, urban, and suburban schools. And it nurtures kids' natural curiosity and creativity. It's what robotics and debate teachers do all the time. You heard Tamara, it's what we did as AP Gov teachers at Clara Barton High School. And the, but these opportunities need to be the norm, not the exception. <laughs> this type of learning makes clear just how outmoded the standardized test-based accountability system is. Of course, the country needs data and how our kids are doing. But if we're talking about student success, research shows that classroom grades, not tests, are the best predictor of that. And experiential learning takes the classroom to a new level. Experiential learning is assessed by teachers in their classrooms, and it focuses on mastery of a skill. It can include capstone projects that allow students to research a topic they're passionate about and present it to their teachers and their peers. It can include nature-based pre-K, where youngsters learn by exploring natural surroundings while building social skills with other kids. It can include students working together to code and build a robotics project, service learning projects to support community members, summer learning on a farm caring for crops or animals, reporting for and producing a neighborhood newsletter. It can start with field trips during and after school. I talk about all of that first because a lot of people know experiential learning as CTE. But experiential learning needs to be broader than career tech ed as we also need to expand career and tech ed. It's been traditionally embedded in career and tech ed programs where students use their minds and hands to learn everything from auto repair to nursing, IT, graphic design, welding, culinary skills. And CTE students learn skills that give them a head start when they go to college or start their careers. So my question is, shouldn't every student have this opportunity? And, and 
It's also a proven strategy. 94% of young people who concentrate in CTE graduate from high school, and 72% of them go to college. Talk to any employer about the skills and knowledge they look for in a successful employee, be it a plumber, a nurse, or a lawyer, and you're bound to hear similarities. Employees who are creative, self-starters, critical thinkers, problem solvers, have empathy and can build relationships. This type of learning provides every student with more options to develop those skills and to find their passion, their purpose, and their pathway to their lives and to good paying jobs and fulfilling careers. Let me just give you an example of carpentry. Carpentry students use math when they're figuring out the right cuts and how the pieces will all fit together. They're using their hands and their minds to construct something. They're acquiring literacy, technology, and writing skills in developing business plans or creating a website. They're building self-confidence and public speaking skills when they're explaining their plans and working with customers or peers. And you just talk to a carpentry student. They have a sense of pride in the finished product. But when the product and project doesn't turn out as expected, they have to problem solve it. They have to figure out what went wrong and try a new approach. Let's bring all these skills together. On Governor's Island in New York City, students attending the Harbor School pursue industry certifications in specialties like marine science and oceanography. In Louisiana, the Teaching and Reach Reaching Initiative has a two-year or is a two-year dual enrollment program that gives high school juniors and seniors the opportunity to earn credits and get a head start in education. In Peoria, Illinois, CTE programs are preparing students for green energy jobs. And in Rio Rancho, New Mexico, public schools partner with a local college to provide stackable micro-credentials in robotics, coding, and automotive technology. So where am I going with this? Think about the opportunity here. President Biden's remaking of the economy through the Chips and Science Act, the Bipartisan Infrastructure Bill, the climate provisions of the Inflation Reduction Act, those things are going to create millions, millions of new paying and high paying jobs in renewable energy, broadband, semiconductors, construction, cybersecurity, transportation, small business, entrepreneurship, and so much more. Did I get them all right, Liz? Liz Schuler, the president of the AFL-CIO, is here with us as well. Think about this. Then there's healthcare and education, which have huge staffing crises right now. There are so many incredible opportunities for our young people in the job markets of today and tomorrow. They need to be ready to seize them. This new economic vision requires a new workforce vision. We need to be dynamic about both the economic vision, which President Biden has created, and a workforce vision that goes along with that. We're all in, as you can tell, but this requires more than educators. And doing it at scale requires new approaches. We need to start in high school, if not before. We need employers to partner with us, giving students internships and apprenticeships, including paid opportunities, so students who need to work can afford to participate. <clears throat> It's why the AFT donated stipends for high school kids in Newark, New Jersey's Red Hawks Rising Teacher Pathway Program. We learned that. And teachers, they need experiential learning too and more externship opportunities in industry. So the potential for all of this is within our grasp, but we all need to do better on the alignment of people preparation, and professions. And it means all of us making changes. I just introduced and said that Liz Schuler is here, the president of the AFL-CIO. We're working closely with the AFL-CIO on this. But we're also working 
with Commerce Secretary Gina Raimondo, Education Secretary Miguel Cardona, Acting Labor Secretary Julie Sue, and the Bloomberg Philanthropies on this work. And we're also reaching out to business groups, large and small, as experiential learning can take place in the private sector, the public sector, and not-for-profits. But this formula of starting by high school, identifying school-to-career pathways, including community colleges, partnering with employers, and ensuring that opportunities can be paid, this can be replicated everywhere. Third, for us to meet the needs of the 50 million children in our public schools, we have to revive the teaching profession. And we have to address the teaching and school staff shortages. And we have to take care of the educators we still have. So we know how to solve this. At our 2022 convention, AFT members unanimously approved the report our Teacher and School Staff Shortage Task Force had been working on for seven months. The report is a blueprint with scalable solutions that every district and every state in the nation can implement. But what does it boil down to? Treating educators like professionals, appropriate pay, time to prepare for classes, a chance to collaborate with colleagues, the opportunity to participate in meaningful professional development, and the authority to make day-to-day -day classroom decisions. And this should be obvious, but I need to say it, Ensuring that they have the conditions to help students learn, like buildings and good repair, safe ventilation, smaller class size. The Kansas City Federation of Teachers recently negotiated a new contract, and they use the AFT staffing shortage report as their blueprint. Now, every first and second year teacher will be mentored by an exemplary teacher who will be paid for serving as a mentor. The union secured the highest starting teacher salaries in the region and also increases to keep teachers in the profession. They won paid family leave for any parent, making them the first district in the state having this essential family benefit. I've asked Jason Roberts, the KCFT president, to be with us today and he is. And my point is this. This is Kansas City, not LA, not New York City. Where there is a will, there is a way. Thank you, Jason, for being with us today. Yeah. Look, I'm really worried about the well-being of teachers and school staff right now. You've all heard why. And we're working with groups like Educators Thriving on strategies that address well-being. Their program has helped teachers reduce emotional exhaustion, which is a leading indicator of burnout. And as a union, we're providing a trauma benefit to all of our members and have worked hard to reduce student debt and make the bipartisan public service loan forgiveness program work. That program has been life-changing for those who qualify. But I'm asking politicians to do their part as well. So this is a word to politicians. Rather than using educators as cannon fire and cannon fodder, why don't you work with us? Look at what New Mexican Governor Michelle Lujan Grisham did she enacted a $10,000 raise for teachers in that state. And what Michigan Governor Gretchen Whitmer did, who signed a bipartisan budget that will make the highest state investment in Michigan's history, investing in school infrastructure, teacher recruitment, school safety, and mental health resources. And then there's, and then there's Senator Bernie Sanders and Florida Representative Frederica Wilson, whose bills would raise teacher salaries. And then there's New York Representative Jamal Bowman, who has just introduced a bill to reduce federally mandated standardized tests so there's more time for teaching. Don't use us as cannon fire. Work with us. Fourth, the pandemic proved what we always knew. 
in-person learning is essential for kids and public schools are centers of their communities. It's beyond obvious that the school family connection, the parent teacher connection are vital to children's success. But as others are trying to drive a wedge in that connection, we need to deepen it. PTAs are remarkable organizations. So are the many parent and parent teacher groups like Red Wine and Blue, Parents Together, Moms Rising, and the Campaign for Our Shared Future. And several representatives of those groups are with us today. And we're honored to work with them and to work with others. But we know as a union, we need to create this muscle of working together everywhere. And that's why the AFT created the Powerful Partnership Institute, which supports family and community engagement. And in our inaugural year, the Institute has given out 27 grants to AFT locals across the country. Montana is engaging thousands of public education supporting families and educators across the state. New Haven is working with educators, families, and students on fair student funding. And you just heard about the great partnership in Houston. Let's go further. Let's also be role models for how we deal with conflicts and disagreement. During the pandemic, we met on Zoom with parent groups that often disagreed with us on COVID safety measures and school closures. We even had a town hall with them. We heard each other out. We talked things through. We need more of that in America. And two years ago, the AFT increased our legal defense fund so we could help if a member was put in jeopardy for teaching honest history or answering a student's question. But in too many places, there are no unions, no education associations, no parent groups. People feel alone. They feel isolated. Teachers, parents, children. So that's why, in conjunction with the Campaign for Our Shared Future, we're launching a new Freedom to Teach and Learn hotline. It's for teachers, parents, and students to use if they need it. It's a place to call if you've been told to remove a book from the curriculum or the library, or that there are topics that can't be discussed in your class, or that you can't teach honestly and appropriately, or politicians in your district or state are targeting vulnerable student groups, probably, just to score political points. The Freedom to Teach and Learn hotline number is 888-873-7227. I'll say it again, 888-873-7227. These four strategies are all worthy on their own. But taken together, they're transformative. Community schools will help young people, as well as their families, recover from these punishing years and the scourge of poverty. It'll help them thrive. Experiential learning will prepare our youth with the knowledge and skills to seize opportunities in our changing economy, and it will be fun. To nurture and educate our young people, we need an educator workforce that is supported, respected, and compensated, befitting the vital role they have. And we need students' circle of care, families, educators, community members to be united in their support. That's our agenda. But this can't just be the work of our union or of school staff or of schools alone. This is the work of a great nation to ensure that our children's basic human needs are met so that they're ready to learn to their full potential to exchange outmoded and test-driven ways of teaching and learning for effective and engaging approaches that excite students and prepare them to live to their dreams and aspirations. Our public schools shouldn't be pawns for politicians' ambitions. They shouldn't, they shouldn't be defunded or destroyed by ideologues. We're at a crossroads. 
fear and division or hope and opportunity. A great nation, a great nation does not fear being educated. A great nation does not fear pluralism. A great nation doesn't have a gun epidemic problem. A great nation chooses freedom and democracy and equality and opportunity and all of that starts in our public schools. We, the United States of America, we are that great nation and we must act together to defend support and strengthen our public schools and we got to do that now. Yeah. Our children deserve no less. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks everybody for coming. Thank you.